Okay, it's one o'clock. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Nirath Padlia. I'm Vice President of Research at uh, Myos Rens Technology, a nutrition company based in Cedar Knolls, New Jersey, with a, with a focus now on animal health. And uh, thank you so much for taking, your, uh, for taking time out of, uh, out, out of your busy schedule today to join us for our webinar that we have sponsored. Uh, today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Leilani Alvarez. Uh, Dr. Alvarez is Director of Integrative Medicine at the Animal Medical Center in New York. Uh, Dr. Alvarez did undergraduate studies at Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, she then went to uh, veterinary school at uh, University of Georgia. She did a residency, uh, followed by that at the Animal Medical Center. And uh, she is the author of, about, uh, of approximately 25 uh, peer-reviewed publications that have uh, to a significant degree focused on supplements in uh, particularly in geriatric dogs. So we're very delighted to uh, have Dr. Alvarez uh, join us and, and speak today to all of you. So uh, w w without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Alvarez. All right, thank you so much. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on this afternoon. I don't know where you're located, but here in New York City, we're having uh, beautiful sunny weather. So I hope you're enjoying some of that. Um, I know this is, these are times of a lot of anxiety and uncertainty and perhaps one of the silver linings, I think there's a lot of online uh, learning happening, a lot of it free, which is fantastic. So I'm really delighted to offer this webinar. I hope that this will leave you today with some really practical things that you can use in your practice uh, in helping you to choose what supplements are appropriate for senior dogs. I would like to begin by saying that senior dogs are uh, perhaps a favorite patient, if you can say that. I learned to really have an appreciation for senior dogs in my rehabilitation practice because it, they comprise a large population of the dogs that I see and I've learned a lot. So I'm going to share some of the knowledge related to um, supplements in particular but also just uh, review of some changes that occur with aging. So this is a summary of what we will be covering today. Um, there's a lot of physiologic changes that happen as we age. A lot of these changes happen in humans as well. And so I'm going to review some of that with you because I think it's important as you're choosing supplements that you're keeping in mind the changes that are taking place in that senior dog so that you can choose appropriately in order to truly supplement their diet. There's a lot of marketing that happens with supplements, uh, which may or may not be verifiable to what is actually in the product. And so we're going to review some things to keep in mind when you're choosing supplements to help make that process a little bit more so you feel more confident in your decision making. So I'll give you some specific advice about actually choosing supplements. And we're going to review specifically evidence for choosing supplements. I'm a very evidence-based practitioner. I work at the Animal Medical Center, which is a tertiary referral hospital, and we're very much about evidence. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing the reasons why I choose certain supplements, which is basically based on level of evidence. And finally, we're going to wrap up by reviewing uh, an integrative approach to senior health, because it shouldn't just be about supplements. It's really about taking a holistic approach um, to keep your senior patients healthy. Uh, I'm going to turn off my video so you can concentrate on the rest of the slides and we'll come back on uh, for the questions. Okay, so I like this little cartoon because I believe it to be true, which is that old dogs are like wine. They improve with age. Uh, certainly for my own personal pets, when they start off very rambunctious as puppies and then they grow up, um, when they're senior dogs, they're wise, just like older people are wise in their old age, you hope anyway. Um, and they, ha they hold a very special place in my heart. Certainly in the US population, there was a survey conducted by Procter & Gamble in 2011 that demonstrated demonstrated that dogs greater than seven years of age, which in many breeds we would consider that to be senior, comprise approximately 49% of the overall U.S. pet population. So that is a lot of dogs. Um, even if you're not in a rehab practice, um, you probably are seeing more and more senior dogs in your practice, regardless of what area you are in. So I think the first thing to establish is how do we determine 
when a dog becomes senior? What, what is that caught off? Um, well, there's actually a couple of very nice papers that have been recently published. Um, the American Association of Animal Hospitals in particular set out um, the canine life stage guidelines. And so that's mostly what I'm going to be presenting to you here, which is that dogs become senior when they're in the last 25% of their life expectancy. So that is going to be different according to the specific breeds that you are seeing because we have a quite a wide range. So you could have a tiny Chihuahua, which their last 25% of their life expectancy is going to be many more years later than would be a giant breed dog like a Great Dane. Um, so here's a general breakdown of when we reach that last 25% of life expectancy. In your giant breed dogs like the Great Dane, that's going to be around six to eight years of age. So when a uh, giant breed dog is six years of age, we consider them to be senior because they're in the last 25% of their life expectancy. For a medium or, uh, or large breed dog, such as a Labrador, um, they become senior after age seven. So from age seven to 10, um, they're senior. And then a small breed dog like a Chihuahua would become senior um, around age nine to 13. So when do they actually become geriatric? I think these terms are used interchangeably, but if you read the life stage guidelines, these terms are actually different. So the difference between a senior dog, which is in the last 25% of their life expectancy, and a geriatric dog is that they have actually gone beyond their life expectancy. That is considered geriatric. Uh, so for example, a Great Dane would be considered geriatric at age nine, a large breed dog would be geriatric at age 11. So basically just one year following that 25% of their life expectancy. And as time goes on and as veterinary medicine continues to advance, we're seeing more and more both senior and geriatric patients. So I think you've probably often heard the term, which is that age is not a disease. And that's true, I agree, age is not a disease. However, there are very many changes that take place as a pet is aging. It pretty much affects every major system in the body. There are changes to the cardiopulmonary system with decreased lung capacity, valvular degeneration. The heart essentially becomes a less efficient pump. Um, there's many changes in the muscles. We're going to be talking about sarcopenia uh, with a lot of uh, loss in muscle mass. There's also generally a decrease in water content for a lot of the tissues in your body, and that has a big effect effect on your musculoskeletal volume. We'll be talking more about that later. Uh, changes to your nervous system. In particular, there's a loss of fine motor skills with a decrease in proprioception and reaction times. And the brain actually atrophies, uh, in particular, the cerebral cortex, which is why we see a lot of decrease in memory, for example, and capacity to learn new skills. Um, there's also a decrease in blood flow to the brain um, and decrease in nerve cell conduction. Changes to the endocrine system, uh, one I think that we all know about is decreases in thyroid levels um, as a pet gets older. And this has effects on the skin, nails, uh, hair, their metabolism, and, and actually pretty significant effects on the musculoskeletal system and the nervous system. In fact, that's one of the things that we check when patients present with neurologic symptoms is check their thyroid levels. Um, there's also changes to the adrenal glands. Um, there is less uh, opportunity to respond to stress. So older dogs are not as capable as responding to a stress, um, as well as changes in electrolyte balance and hormonal levels. Uh, we know that um, in intact males, testosterone drops. Um, and so a lot of changes to those uh, endocrine organs. There's also changes to other organ function, in particular liver and kidney. So we know that um, as dogs age, even if you're not seeing azotemia in the blood work, we know that as the body gets older, there's going to be a decrease in uh, both the, the a GFR, so you're going to have a decrease in GFR and, and generally a slower drug metabolism, both for kidneys and liver. So you might want to 
keep that in mind when you're dosing particular drugs um, and know what their elimination is. Um, for the skin, it becomes less elastic, um, less moisture. I, I don't know about um, you, how young you are in the audience, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting old and noticing wrinkles. Uh, and the wrinkles happen because of loss of elasticity. Uh, and also your skin just gets drier. Um, and so with that loss of moisture and loss of elasticity, you know, you get this sort of saggy looking face, uh, which we see in dogs as well. I have a great Dane here and you can see a loss of pigment in his hair, which is another thing that happens with aging, as well as just a, a little bit more of a droopy appearance and less muscle tone, um, not just over the face, but all over the body. Um, and then there's changes also in the joints. Um, we're going to be talking about that more specifically. So age is not a disease. However, um, there are a lot, a lot of physiologic changes that take place with aging. Um, what are some of the most common conditions we see in our senior and geriatric pet population? Uh, sarcopenia is, a, is pretty much always going to happen, uh, which is a loss of muscle mass and tone in the absence of disease. Um, we also tend to see a lot of obesity because of that decrease in metabolism from decreasing thyroid levels and overall capacity to exercise or decrease exercise tolerance. So we see an increase in obesity. Uh, we also see osteoarthritis is more commonly diagnosed in, in our older population cognitive dysfunction, incontinence, both urinary and fecal, um, sleep changes. Some dogs will sleep longer. Um, they tend to sleep less at night, unfortunately, for their owners, but there are a lot of sleep changes. Again, this is due to the changes that are happening in the brain, um, loss of vision and hearing, um, as well as cancer. Um, so as they get older, the risk for neoplasia increases. Uh, so I put a little asterisk here next to the things that happen in the absence of disease. So as we talked about age is not a disease, we would consider obesity, osteoarthritis, the cognitive dysfunction, uh, and neoplasia. These are actually diseased states, uh, which potentially we can treat. Uh, however, the changes that occur naturally due to aging, which we would not consider a disease, include sarcopenia, the changes in sleep, loss of vision in here, and, and there are others, but these are the most common. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about these physiologic changes that take place with aging. Um, so there's an overall decrease in conduction velocity of the nerves, um, the cerebral size, so the brain actually does get smaller with less blood flow. Um, our kidney function decreases, there's less blood flow coming to the liver. Uh, basal metabolic rate decreases, that's why they're prone to obesity. Uh, decrease in cardiac output and lung capacity as well as muscle mass. It's very nice article uh, about all of these changes published in uh, JAVMA 2015. So let's talk specifically about um, the changes that affect movement, which is my area of specialty. So cardiopulmonary changes, of course, very relevant to movement. So with that decrease in lung capacity and the heart becoming a less efficient pump, the cardiac output decreases by as much as 30% in older dogs. Uh, we also see valvular degeneration, which essentially means, you know, the same changes we're seeing all over the body. The heart is has muscle uh, and that muscle can weaken. Uh, and so the valves don't shut as precisely as they do when they're younger and they start to leak a little bit. Um, and that's again from loss of elasticity and also contractile strength in the valves. And so you start to hear a heart murmur. Um, and so mitral valve degeneration is something we commonly see as dogs get older. What this means practically for your patients is that there's going to be a decrease in tolerance for exercise. Um, and what you need to do as a clinician, as far as giving advice for your patients, is to lower the intensity of the exercise. So they should still be going out for walks every day, but I may not have them run or do sprints anymore or make sure that you warm them up for five to 10 minutes before you do a little trot. Also, uh, in general, the duration of exercise should be shorter because of these changes in car cardiopulmonary capacity. Um, and while the duration of each activity should be less with a lower intensity, you can actually increase the frequency. And this would be actually beneficial to maintaining healthy cardiopulmonary function. 
the changes in the nervous system are actually quite significant and perhaps leads to some of the more common complaints that we hear from clients. Um, so we already talked about some of this. There's a loss in fine motor coordination. Um, and we also see a decrease in conduction velocity. So the actual nerve is not firing as quickly as it did before. Um, and this affects a, basically a delayed reaction time. We also see uh, smaller brains. So you can see in our picture here, this is, this is a human brain, but um, this is a this is a healthy adult brain and this is a senior uh, brain and you can see how much smaller it is and it's particularly atrophied in the cerebral cortex. Uh, this is an area, of course, that controls voluntary functions. Um, and we see a loss of the actual number of neurons, particularly in the hippocampus, uh, which is critical for learning and memory. Um, we also see things like beta amyloid plaques forming in the brain. So this is similar to what we see in humans with Alzheimer's patients. Um, there's also a lot of oxidative damage to the brain with free radicals and a decrease in neurotransmitters, in particular dopamine, um, which is responsible for movement, learning, memory, emotions. Um, and we also see a decrease in blood flow to the brain. And the, the brain is very, very sensitive to levels of glucose in particular. And so with the decrease in blood flow means that there's less glucose arriving to the brain. Um, and so just all of your thinking capacities are going to be uh, affected because of this. Um, and again, decrease in nerve cell connections. Um, in addition to that, we see a lot of cognitive dysfunction in our patients. In fact, approximately 60% of dogs over the age of 10 will experience some symptoms of canine cognitive syndrome. Um, and I like these little um, abbreviations here uh, for remembering what the common symptoms are. So when clients present to you, you're like, oh yeah, that's, that's cognitive dysfunction because they have DISH. So that stands for um, disorientation and dysfunction and in interactions. Um, so this is interactions with owners or other pets in the household, um, as well as changes in sleep uh, and house training. So it's disorientation and dysfunction in interactions, sleep and house training. So you, they start having accidents inside the house. Um, and then a more comprehensive one is disorientation and dysfunction in sleep, house training, but also in decreases in activity, uh, an increase in anxiety, and a decrease in learning um, capacity. So, so now we're incorporating everything together. So dish all. So we're seeing changes to sleep, house training, activity, anxiety, and learning. So these are the common changes that we see with cognitive dysfunction. What about the changes that occur to the musculoskeletal system? Well, there are many. Um, as we already discussed, sarcopenia is a decrease in muscle mass in the absence of disease. This is a progressive and generalized loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength, um, and is something that happens naturally as we get older. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen these uh, senior like marathon runners, you know, they're clearly in the best shape, but they just, they just don't have that nicely defined musculature that we see in a, in a younger athlete. Um, and here you can see a picture of the difference of a, a younger person um, in their forelimb musculature compared to uh, an elderly person. You know, everything is just atrophied. And a lot of that is due to an increase in protein turnover. So we have increase in protein catabolism uh, and degeneration, uh, also coinciding with a decrease in protein synthesis. Um, so all of that leads to an overall decrease in lean body mass with a replacement of increase in body fat. So we lose muscle mass and we gain adipose, and that is not a good thing. In addition, um, as we said, there's overall a decrease in water content that, that occurs with aging all over the body, but in particular, um, this has a big impact in our musculoskeletal structure. So the tendons, for example, uh, will have a decrease in water content, and that will decrease their contractile ability and their elasticity. There's also, again, because of some of these changes we discussed in the nervous system, there's going to be a loss of nerve input to the muscle. And what that means is that the, the, the that muscle is just not 
going to fire exactly in the right timing as when the nerve sends that signal to it. So the brain may say, okay, I want to move this limb forward, but that's just going to be a little bit delayed because that connection is just not as strong as it is in a younger patient. And what that means practically when you have that loss of timing of the muscle, tendon, and nerve connection is you have poor coordination. And so that's going to lead to poor proprioception. And so that is our body's ability to recognize where our limbs are in space. And so you can trip more easily. You're at higher risk for injury when that happens. We know that certainly in older people, you need to be thinking about that in your older dogs um, because they're just not as precise in their movements. So definitely an increased risk for injury. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about specific changes that occur in the joint itself. So here you can see the normal structure of a joint. So we have uh, our nice uh, bone and periosteum um, al aligning uh, along the margins of that bone is a layer of cartilage um, and then in between the two bones, we're going to have joint fluid um, and then also a layer of synovium, uh, which makes up the joint capsule. Um, so that is what a healthy joint should look like. Uh, when there's been an injury to that joint, and this can actually occur in a younger animal as well, but we see it very commonly in older dogs, we'll see a destruction to that cartilage lining, uh, as well as changes to the actual synovium, where we see more water content and less elastin in the synovial fluid. Um, elastin, um, and particularly hyaluronic acid, is what gives that viscoelastic property, so that sort of stringiness of joint fluid, uh, which basically is a shock absorption for the joint. So when this gets replaced with more water, we have less capacity for shock absorption. So a lot of inflammatory changes that take place in the synovium. So you can see how thick the synovial uh, tissue has gotten compared to the normal joint. And also what happens is the ligaments that help stabilize joints as well as the tendons, which are not pictured here, will become more lax. So we lose elasticity and we have increased water content in those ligaments ligaments and tendons. So then that means that we have more instability in the joint. So even if there hasn't been an injury, we tend to see um, more instability in the joints. Um, in addition to the cartilage thinning, there's also less production of the extracellular matrix, uh, which is all of the essential um, nutrients that provide, that provide the joints, so including things like glucosaminoglycans. Um, so yeah, a lot of these changes Changes again are going to increase the risk for injury, but also increase the risk for development of osteoarthritis. So this is again one of the most common conditions that we see in our elderly pet population is osteoarthritis because of all of these changes, many of which happen just naturally with aging. All right, so with that, um, sorry if I bored you with a lot of physiology, but I think it's really important to understand those physiologic changes as you're making choices for joint supplements. So the Oral supplement industry is something that has really boomed uh, beginning in the early 2000s into a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, the last survey that was conducted uh, demonstrated in the U.S. population, people are spending upwards of about $30 billion on oral supplements, and a third of that spending actually is on glucosamine and chondroitin, and I'm going to show you some of the evidence for, for that, those particular supplements. Unfortunately, the oral supplement industry is largely unregulated compared to the pharmaceutical industry, and we're lacking the robust randomized controlled clinical trials that is necessary in order to get FDA labeling of a pharmaceutical. Um, more often than not, we lack the knowledge of what the pharmacokinetics are of those supplements, what potential side effects they may have, uh, both in particular patients, but also in drug interactions. So when patients are taking supplements, this is usually because they are having some type of medical condition, and so they're often taking a pharmaceutical drug. And often because of lack of testing and controlled clinical trials, we don't even know um, what potential drug interactions might happen between a pharmaceutical drug and an oral supplement. So it really opens up for the possibility of, of harm to the patient when we just don't know what the pharmacokinetics are, the side effects and drug interactions. In particular, you know, how do you know what the correct dose is? Do you even know what the bioavailability is of those supplements in that species? Um, and, and really important to realize 
finds that the way the regulations are set out right now, the validity of any advertising claims uh, and what's written on the bottle, that responsibility rests on the manufacturer. Uh, so clearly there's a high risk for potential bias there because the manufacturer's interest, of course, is to sell the supplement. So they're going to try to paint, you know, a really positive picture of all the benefits that their supplement can have. But is that backed by actual scientific information? So I will encourage you, um, you know, as we go through this talk and, and moving forward that you hold supplements up to the same standards that you would a pharmaceutical drug. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, you know, what is actually in the bottle? Um, there was this really nice article that was actually published and it just really was eye-opening for me. And this happens, of course, all the time. But so um, the New York State Attorney Gen General actually cited um, four major retailers. This included GNC, Target, Walmart, and Walgreens uh, for fraudulent and dangerous herbal supplements supplements. Out of uh, all the products that they tested, they found that four out of the five products contained none of the listed ingredients on the level. So now I'm not just saying like they were missing one of the ingredients. They had none of them at all. Um, and 20% of them contained at least one um, ingredient that was not listed on the label. So um, that's that's pretty frightening when you think about, you know, how many supplements these types of retailers are sell selling on a daily basis. Um, there's a very high risk of contamination in supplements of heavy metals, um, pesticides, so things like fungi in particular can grow if they're not kept um, in, a, in a dry location. So if they are exposed to moisture, you can get growth of various um, fungi, but also bacteria, in particular, if there's a lot of plant materials in there. Um, and then there's also the risk of contamination with pharmaceuticals. Uh, there was a really great article published in JAM. So that's the equivalent of our JAVMA um, journal. So this is the Journal of the American Medical Association. This was published in 2018, um, where they actually looked at supplements over a four-year period um, and sampled randomly supplements. They found that nearly 800 supplements had unapproved pharmaceutical ingredients that were not listed on the label. And we think the reason why that's so common is because the pharmaceutical drug they, that they usually taint in the supplement has the effect that the manufacturer is advertising and so potentially increasing the efficacy that the real risk with that of course is that if your patient is on a pharmaceutical drug that could potentially interact with that pharmaceutical drug well you'd want to know that that's in there so how can you protect yourself and your patients from being exposed to what we know is happening in the supplement industry with um, non-verifiable ingredients um, in the bottle. So this is my advice to you about how to choose quality supplements. So again, I, I mentioned this already, but for me, I think it's important and it is possible to hold supplements to the same standards you would a pharmaceutical drug. And what does that mean? Well, pharmaceutical drugs go through rigorous FDA labeling and that requires both safety testing uh, so that we know what dose is appropriate and what dose would be toxic. Um, as well as efficacy studies where they're doing randomized controlled clinical trials that so then to back up the claim, right? So if, if this drug is supposed to decrease pain in the joint, then you actually have to test it in animals that have joint disease and does it actually decrease their pain. Um, and then you really want to demonstrate that they're bioavailable and efficacious. Uh, that's really critical, especially in bioavailability, because a lot of supplements have low bioavailability. Um, and then this is really, really key that you have a quality assurance by a third party laboratory. Um, and so common labels that you can look out for that tells you that there's third-party laboratory testing taking place is the GMP label. So that's the good manufacturing practice label. You will see that in higher end human supplements. The equivalent of that in veterinary medicine is the National Animal Supplement Council label. Um, there's also the US Pharmacopedia label, which you will see on like nature's made supplements. Um, anyway, you, typically when you see one of these seals, that means that they have a third party that is verifying the ingredients in the list. Um, even if that's not on the label, a reputable company should be regularly testing their products with a third party laboratory and they should have a certificate of analysis demonstrating that testing. So for any company that you're 
considering uh, purchasing a supplement from, I would encourage you to ask them for their certificate of analysis. Um, and if they're doing a good job, they should not hesitate to share that with you. Also, I personally like to see in vivo testing with rigorous randomized controlled clinical trials. So a lot of these companies will quote in vitro studies. And while that's useful and almost necessary in the beginning stages of developing a product, we know from many other examples that how a molecule behaves in a Petri dish can be very different than how it behaves in the whole supplement when it's taken by an individual, again, in large, but because of the bioavailability of that product. Product. And also, we don't just want information about the single ingredients. How does the whole product um, behave in the, an, in the live animal? Because a lot of these products have combination herbals in them, and we want to test that whole product. And we want to test it in the species that you're using it in. Because, for example, uh, you know, it's nice to have, for example, a rat study. But if what you're treating is a dog, it may not be that relevant how this product was you know, behaved in a rat. You really want that in vivo randomized controlled clinical trial to be for the condition that you're treating and in the species that you intend to use it in. And a couple of, uh, oh, and I also think it's important uh, for particularly in our industry that you can administer the supplement easily so that it's highly palatable uh, because the last thing you want, if, especially if your patient's already taking some pharmaceutical drugs, to have to shove another pill down their throat. Um, so I really like to choose supplements that are tasty and easy to administer because that just means that there's going to be more compliance. And some useful resources for you about finding out about how reputable a product is, is consumerlab.com. That does require a yearly subscription, but it's only about $42 a year. So it's, I think it's really worth the money. And we'll compare both human products and veterinary products and really a lot of useful information there, including uh, what clinical trials have been conducted on those products. Um, and then also a free service, which is put out by the National Institutes of Health. That's the Dietary Supplement Label Data. Base, um, and that's the website uh, for that. So you can just Google dietary supplement label database or just type in the dsld.nlm.nih.gov. Uh, Similar type of information as consumerlab.com's, uh, but uh, it's free. All right, so let's talk about some of the evidence we have currently for some of the more common supplements that are used in senior patients. So um, this is a really nice study that was published in the human literature in the Journal of Sports Medicine in 2018. This was a large systematic review and meta-analysis. So as you probably know, there's a various levels of evidence uh, when we're looking at scientific articles. So the lowest level of evidence would be like you know, an expert opinion like me, right? I'm giving you my expert opinion about what I think about supplements. Um, and then we have the next level up would be like case reports. Um, and then after that, that we have randomized controlled clinical trials. That's a much higher level of evidence. But then the elite and the highest level of evidence is when we basically look at all of the different randomized controlled clinical trials that have been published about that topic. And then we look at them all together and we actually run statistical tests to really sift out, you know, what is really clinically significant from all of these papers that have been published. The systematic reviews and meta-analyses that are published on the human side are far more rigorous than what we're doing on the veterinary side, which is why I'm presenting it to you here, because we, we just unfortunately at this time don't have this high of rigor in our um, meta-analyses. But so this is a really important one. It was conducted on 69 randomized controlled clinical trials involving more than 11,000 patients, humans, that were suffering from osteoarthritis, including hand arthritis, hip arthritis, and knee arthritis. The, the majority of these patients actually suffered from knee osteoarthritis, and they tested um, 20 different supplements uh, that were for osteoarthritis. The conclusion from this systematic review and meta-analysis was that most supplements used, um, the most common being glucosamine and chondroitin, did not have clinically effective changes in the patients. Um, so that's a pretty bold conclusion to make. There were some limited studies, including Boswellia and curcumin, that did show a moderate, moderate to large effect on 
pain and disability in the short term. So this study broke it up into short term being less than three months, medium term being four to six months, and long term effects greater than six months. Um, and as it turns out, no supplements were effective for pain at the medium or long term. So that was the four to six months or greater than six months, except for green lip muscle extract and undenatured collagen too. Um, so that's human, that's the human evidence and that's basically the, the latest information available on the human side. So what about the veterinary side? Uh, so let's talk about glucosamine chondroitin, definitely the most common ingredient and in supplements that people are choosing. I actually gave a talk at VMX in January and I, and I did a poll to the audience and sure enough, the, the majority of people sitting in the audience, the ingredient that they were using for a joint supplement included glucosamine and chondroitin. Uh, well, here's a summary of the evidence we have uh, for glucosamine chondroitin for clinical trials in dogs. Um, so the first and probably most rigorous uh, trial that was conducted uh, was by Moreau in 2003. This was a double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial that compared glucosamine and chondroitin to a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Um, they used objective gait analysis, including force plate platform, um, and they concluded that there was no benefit of glucosamine and chondroitin. Um, then after that, we have a couple of studies that were published in 2007, uh, where um, McCarthy in 2007, um, this was also a double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial um, with dogs that suffered from naturally occurring osteoarthritis. Um, they looked at five different subjective measures, primarily looking at pain scores. Um, the group that received glucosamine and chondroitin improved in three of those subjective outcome measures, whereas the dogs that were taking the non anti-inflammatory improved in all five of those subjective outcome measures. So while there was some improvement in the glucosamine chondroitin group, it was a far greater improvement in the non group. And again, Again, there was no objective measures that were measured here. Um, unlike the Moreau study that had objective uh, outcome measures, the McCarthy study only looked at subjective outcome measures. Another study published in 2008 by Antilio um, demonstrated uh, improvements in activity as measured by an accelerometer and decrease in pain scores, but that was only when glucosamine and chondroitin was paired with undenatured collagen too. Um, and then a very nice systematic review that was published in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2012, which concluded for all the available evidence um, that the evidence was poor for using glucosamine chondroitin in, in, in live patients. So in in clinical dogs with osteoarthritis, there is very poor level of evidence for glucosamine and chondroitin. So where do we have more evidence? So per perhaps the most robust evidence for treating osteoarthritis is with omega-3 fatty acids. We know that because of in vitro studies demonstrating a strong anti-inflammatory effect, um, primarily due to the EPA and DHA. You do want to source these from fish-based. Um, as opposed to plant-based omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and they decrease the inflammatory cytokines that we see are released in uh, arthritic joints. So that includes interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. So omega-3 fatty acids at high enough doses will decrease those inflammatory cytokines, in addition to decreasing matrix metalloprotease, COX-2, which is, of course, what NSAIDs block, 5-lipooxygenase, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. We have actually several canine studies that were conducted that showed both a decrease, uh, that showed both objective measure improvements as well as subjective measures and increasing peak vertical force. So that's force plate platform. Um, so the dogs are basically putting more weight through the limb. In addition to visually, they had decrease in their lameness scores. Uh, I want to emphasize that all of these studies that were published on the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids in dogs with their OA were actually in joint diets. So these were like these amazing studies that have been published by Purina and Hills, and actually Royal Canin has done some studies as well. Um, and so it's not as a separate or 
oral supplement is actually fortified in the diet. And the reason for that is, you know, I personally, if I'm using omega-3s as an oral supplement, you need to get at a high enough anti-inflammatory dose. And so that's going to be, for me, a minimum of 100 mg per kg of total EPA and DHA, or um, if you're looking at just EPA alone, 50 mg per kg. And what happens when you get at doses that high, you will frequently see diarrhea in your patients. So um, if possible, if there's no contraindication to doing a joint protective diet, that's my preference is to provide the omega-3 in the diet as opposed to separately as an oral supplement. Green lip muscle, as we mentioned from the human studies, um, is well supported um, in the scientific literature for decreasing the um, symptoms of osteoarthritis. This is derived from an organism, a, a muscle that grows naturally in New Zealand. It's called perna cannuliculus. Um, this muscle is naturally rich in not just omega-3 fatty acids, but other polyunsaturated fatty, ac fatty acids that have anti-inflammatory effects. They also have vitamins, amino acids, and minerals that can be beneficial in patients dealing with osteoarthritis. And it's provided in a concentrated lipid extract. And there are several canine studies that demonstrate um, in Dogs suffering from naturally occurring osteoarthritis decreases in pain, joint swelling, increases in mobility and musculoskeletal scores. We also have a systematic review on the human side demonstrating that um, green lip muscle was superior to placebo in patients suffering from mild to moderate OA. Um, so if my patient can't take omega-3s um, in a diet, in a fortified diet, I typically tend to choose green lip muscle extract as an oral supplement as opposed to the omega-3s, just because you can get away with lower doses because it's a more concentrated lipid extract than the omega-3s. But we can talk about that at the end if you're interested in learning more about that. Curcumin is another commonly... Um, um, common new supplement, relatively new supplement that people are using in older patients. This is a polyphenol extract that's derived from turmeric. Um, you may have actually, you may, might be most familiar with is in Indian cooking. Um, it's a tuber uh, that's very yellow in color and frequently used in, in Indian cuisine. Um, this has been used for centuries um, in traditional cultures. It has been studied extensively. The in vitro studies are actually amazing um, for demonstrating both anti inflammatory effects and antineoplastic effects. You know, as we think about our geriatric patient population, we see a lot of cancer. So to have an anti-inflammatory and an antineoplastic herbal is phenomenal. The problem with curcumin is it's extremely low oral bioavailability. I mean, I'm talking less than 1% bioavailability. And by the way, glucosamine chondroitin, that might be a reason why in glucosamine chondroitin, we see great benefit of glucosamine chondroitin in the in vitro studies. Um, but in vivo, we just don't see the same level of efficacy. And we know at least in dogs, glucosamine only has approximately a 12% bioavailability and chondroitin sulfate an even lower bioavailability to about 5%. But look at good curcumin, it's even less, it's only less than 1%. So, you know, you take it by mouth, but you know, it just gets pooped out essentially. So, you know, what's the worth of spending that amount of money on a supplement if it's not actually getting in the body. Um, and we also have the probably the most rigorous study uh, in canines looking at curcumin. Um, it was with a, an extract of turmeric uh, cur curcuma. Um, this was published in veterinary record in 2003, a randomized controlled clinical trial with 61 dogs, um, which demonstrated no improvement in their peak vertical force when they were taking curcumin. So again, you know, while the in vitro data is fantastic, um, we're having trouble demonstrating that in vivo. Although the human studies are a little bit better, but that's because the companies have figured out how to increase their bioavailability. So that would be the key. If you want to use curcumin, you want them to have been tested uh, in the bioavailability. All right, what about Boswellia serrata? This is another common ingredient that we're seeing. Um, this is a resin extract from a naturally growing tree that grows in North Africa and the Middle East, also known as Indian frankincense. Um, so boswellic acid is the extract which has its anti-inflammatory effects. It turns out that boswellic acid is a potent inhibitor of 5-lipooxygenase. So in your arachidonic acid cascade, you know, we have the COX-1 and COX-2, but also 5-lipooxygenase. Um, and so 
that's what Basuela serrata targets. And we, again, have some, you know, decent studies here, although some of these were not double blind. So there was an open uh, center, multi-center study that showed a decrease in lameness and pain in 71% of the dogs that were taking Boswellia. And another randomized controlled clinical trial um, with dogs suffering from natural OA, this was not just a pure Boswellia product, but it was Boswellia com combined with some other herbals that did show some objective measures where there was an increase in peak vertical force and increases in daily activity <clears throat> as measured by an accelerometer. Very interesting study. Um, that was published um, just last year out of the University of Florida. Um, so this is um, Aaron Misiosa under the guidance of Justin Schmalberg, who's a board certified nutritionist at Florida. So what they did is they um, sampled six human supplements containing Boswellia and seven canine formulations. And the mean detected Boswellic acid was 173% of the concentration listed on the label. So, you know, we see both ends of the spectrum where the product Product may have less than what it's supposed to in the label. And in this study, they showed for Boswellia, there was actually a much higher concentration than what the label indicated. There was a very large variation in the Boswellic acid extract concentrations compared to the label claims. Um, all products met or exceeded the label claims. And really the conclusion that I would take from that study is that you must confirm the active ingredient with an independent laboratory. Because again, Boswellia blocks five lipooxygenase. So there is a potential for interaction with other drugs, and you need to make sure that you know what you're actually giving your patient. Eggshell membrane is another product um, that has come out recently. Um, this is derived from that, that little inner membrane inside the eggshell happens to be very rich in proteins and is a natural source of elastin, collagen, and glucosamine and glycans. Great in vitro studies for its antioxidant properties and also in vivo studies demonstrating improved range of motion, mobility, and flexibility. A nice prospective clinical trial that was conducted in 2008 with 58 dogs dogs um, that demonstrated after 28 days uh, an improvement in activity and mobility beginning as early as seven days after taking the eggshell membrane product uh, and peaking at 28 days. Astaxanthin, astaxanthin is perhaps one of my favorite um, supplements that is naturally derived. It's perhaps one of the most potent an antioxidants known to nature. It comes from red marine algae. Um, and we have three really great studies um, in our canine population, uh, one showing an enhanced immune response in dogs, another showing um, basically an improvement in mitochondrial function uh, for age-related oxidative damage and inflammatory changes. And the effect was actually greatest in the geriatric dogs compared to the young dogs. So that's exactly who we're targeting, right? Um, so we know there's oxidative damage happening as we age, um, and astaxanthin has a greater benefit in older dogs than younger dogs. Another study that was conducted on sled dogs, so these are endurance athletes, uh, where they were fed an astaxanthin-enriched diet, and the dogs that got astaxanthin had an increased level of pre-exercise triglycerides. So um, you may not know this, but canine endurance athletes rely primarily on free fatty acids, so fat, as their main energy source during their competition. And so to be able to preserve those triglycerides pre-exercise basically allows them to perform better. And then post-exercise, the dogs getting astaxanthin had a, had a lesser um, degree of decrease in glucose, so allowed them to preserve their glycogen, which again allows them to be able to return to their sport more efficiently. Um, so astaxanthin may mitigate that exercise-induced fatigue and improve exercise performance. Uh, Cannabinoids uh, is another sort of hot topic. Um, it's the CBD that you're really looking for that has its analgesic and anti-inflammatory effects. It can improve appetite, um, decrease anxiety, and in the human literature, it's particularly effective for reducing neuropathic pain. There's a very extensive endocannabinoid receptor system in our bodies, and that's preserved actually across different species, um, which is why CBD can be so effective. Um, we know there there's a synergistic effect between CBD with opioids and alpha-2 agonists. 
uh, particularly effective for managing chronic and refractory neuropathic pain, uh, cancer patients in particular, because there is also an anti-poptotic and anti-angiogenesis uh, effect with CBD. Um, it was originally a DEA Schedule One drug, which was why it was so impossible to get your hands on it. And then it got changed to Schedule Five drug. And very recently, actually just last month, it is now unscheduled. So you no longer need a DEA license to prescribe CBD. It is now unscheduled. The very first drug that became FDA approved that was CBD was Epidiolex. That was for children with refractory seizures. And now there's actually others. Um, the only two companies in the veterinary industry that have prospective clinical trials testing CBD is Elevet and ABSC. So ABSC were studies out of Colorado State University and Elevet out of Cornell University. Um, Elevet uh, is the one that conducted the pharmacokinetic study demonstrating bioavailability of CBD, as well as determining the correct dose, uh, which they determined to be two mg per kg as a starting dose and then reducing to one mg per kg um, for dogs with osteoarthritis. And they did an efficacy study with arthritis as well, which is really nice to see. Um, so going back to our, you know, something I really wanted to focus on today, uh, which is muscle atrophy that occurs in older dogs, you know, muscle atrophy can occur from cachexia. So that would be in states, for example, of cardiac disease or renal disease. We know we see muscle loss due to disease. So that would be cachexia, uh, sarcopenia, muscle loss in the absence of disease in, in older animals. And then there's also disuse atrophy that could be from either immobilization, let's say after a surgery, uh, or inactivity from just not using the limb associated with recovery from an injury or surgery, or if it's painful. If you're painful, you're just not going to use the limb. And all three of those can lead to disuse muscle atrophy. The common link between all of these processes, whether it's cachexia, sarcopenia, or disuse atrophy is that there's going to be a rise in serum myostatin. So myostatin is one of those molecules that is intricately involved in a complex mechanism that regulates how myocytes both build muscle and also degrade muscle. So myostatin mRNA will lead to an increase in muscle catabolism, so a breakdown of muscle proteins, and also a decrease in muscle protein synthesis. So essentially, if you want to maintain muscle mass, you don't want high levels of myostatin. You want lower levels of myostatin is what allows the body to build muscle. Um, so there's this product that I've actually been using since 2015, Fortitropin. It's derived from fertilized chicken egg yolks. Um, it is quite safe. Uh, it undergoes a high pressure pasteurization and dehydration, which while killing all of those harmful organisms like bacteria, viruses, and fungi, it will preserve the biological integrity and in nutrients. Um, it will, it's been shown um, in some human studies and also also some canine studies um, that it decreases myostatin levels. So again, you know, you want a lower level of myostatin in order to be able to build muscle mass. So this might help to increase both muscle size and muscle mass. Um, and this is a really awesome study. Again, it's pretty rare in the supplement industry to see products that are backed by rigorous randomized controlled clinical trials. This study was just published in April of this year, um, led out of Kansas State University by Ken Harkin um, and his resident Dana White. Um, and this was a study, a very large scale study involving 100 dogs. This was a double blind placebo controlled randomized controlled clinical trial where 50 of the dogs received uh, fortitropin and the other 50 received a macronutrient match supplement and they didn't know which was which. So it was blinded and they received the supplement for a period of 12 weeks following a TPLO surgery. And what they found was that there was no change in the serum myostatin levels in the group receiving fortitropin. However, in the placebo group that didn't get fortitropin, we saw increases in myostatin. Again, remember that when you get an increase in myostatin, that means an increase in protein degradation and a decrease in protein synthesis for the muscle. And that occurred um, between week zero, so that was right after the TPO surgery, to week eight. Um, so again, demonstrating that fortitropin really preserved the myostatin levels, uh, whereas in the placebo group, we did not see that. In addition, they also measure, measured thigh circumference. So this is a measure of the girth of the limb. Um, so it's an indirect measure of muscle mass. And what they demonstrated 
demonstrated was that the group of dogs that got the fortitropin, their thigh circumference did not decrease. So in other words, they did not atrophy. Uh, Conversely, in the placebo group, there was a significant decrease in the thigh circumference for the dogs that were getting the placebo supplement. Also, we saw that there was an increase in weight bearing. So they, they used the static um, analyzer for the amount of weight that was placed through each limb. And that was increased significantly in both groups, which is to be expected. You know, as you recover from a TPLO, you expect that weight bearing is going to improve. Um, they also measured serum myostatin in this study, and they did demonstrate that there were lower levels of myostatin in the fortitropin group. Um, so again, demonstrating bioavailability of the product. So essentially the conclusion from this um, rigorous randomized controlled clinical trial is that fortitropin was able to prevent disused muscle atrophy in this group of dogs recovering from a TPLO surgery. Um, a little bit of detail about what's actually in fortitropin, because one of the questions that comes up in your senior patients, a lot of them suffer from kidney disease. Um, and so this is um, what is typically found in prescription therapeutic renal diets. Um, this was published in today's veterinary practice, and I listed it for both dogs and cats. Um, so what really matters, a lot of people think we need to restrict protein in older dogs and cats, but really what we care about more for renal function is the amount of phosphorus. So uh, in grams per thousand kil kilocals, we want to be at around 0.4 to 1.2 grams per thousand kilocals, and in cats at 0.0. 8 to 1.3 grams per kilocals. So here's what's actually in fortitropin. So you'll see the phosphorus here is listed at 800 milligrams per 100 grams. So I went ahead and did a little math for you guys so that you can feel comfortable in prescribing this for your patients with renal disease. Um, and so you can see my math there, but one scoop of fortitropin has three grams in it. And so that turns out to be 0 0.24 grams of phosphorus per scoop. Um, and then for protein, if you're interested in following the protein guidelines, it's about one gram of protein per scoop. Um, and the guidelines in dogs, at least, um, if they're less than 25 pounds, you're going to give one gram daily. Um, and so you can see that that's going to be well below um, the guidelines um, set out for a therapeutic renal diet. And same even if you look at the dosing for a 25 to 50 pound dog, they're going to get two grams daily um, and greater than 50 pounds, four grams daily. So very much in the safe margin if you're wanting to use fortitropin for an elderly patient that is suffering from chronic renal disease. So finally, I just wanted to end by reminding you that it's not just about supplements, it's about really taking an integrative approach where you're combining both conventional medicine, complementary and alternative strategies, and a patient-centered approach. That is what truly is integrative health. Um, so the conventional would be things like the pharmaceutical drugs that you very much will need in managing your geriatric and senior patients, as well as monitoring their blood work. Uh, for complementary and alternative, that includes making sure that your patients are getting exercise. Physical rehabilitation um, might be very useful for those older patients. Excellent nutrition, and of course, use of supplements, uh, wi uh, wisely chosen for your senior patients. And But don't forget about the patient-centered aspect. And and that's the social and mental well-being of your patient, which is particularly important in your senior pet population. So don't forget about the importance of exercising. It's a natural way to re release endorphins, maintain mobility and muscle mass and joint health. Uh, we know it actually increases longevity. Um, and in this study that was published in 2013 in JAVMA, they found that dogs suffering from hip dysplasia that did at least a third I'm sorry, at least an hour of exercise per day, um, they had a decreased percent in lameness scores versus dogs that only exercise 15 minutes a day. So don't be afraid to exercise your senior patients. There's also, of course, a social benefit to doing that. Um, also, don't forget that very high risk of obesity in our senior patients. The number one risk factor for developing arthritis is obesity. So their daily energy requirement is going to decrease by as much as 30 to 40 percent. So you need to feed less calories as dogs get older. Um, and studies have shown that as weight increases, the degree of osteoarthritis increases uh, coinciding with that. Um, and 
Part of that is that adipose tissue itself is pro-inflammatory. It releases pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's like an active endocrine organ and contributes to chronic pain and also neoplasia. So weight management should always be a priority if you have a dog that is not in an ideal body condition score of four or five out of nine. Um, also, just to touch on geriatric nutrition, um, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer, um, but Justin Schmalberg in particular and Joe Wachschlag, uh, who are double boarded in sports medicine and nutrition, they really advocate for feeding older dogs a higher amount of protein. So again, if there's renal disease, focus on decreasing the phosphorus and less the protein. Um, so compared to an adult diet where you're aiming for 60 grams per thousand kcals, an uh, older dog should be getting greater than 70 five grams per thousand kcals in their diet, you do want to reduce their fat a little bit and especially reduce their carbohydrate because this is what's going to lead to them getting fat is that excess carbohydrate. Finally, um, don't forget about mental well-being. Older dogs uh, really benefit from having their mind stimulated, so take them outside as much as possible. Even if they can't ambulate normally, you can take them out in a stroller and just let them be outside. Smell in particular, olfaction is very important to dogs. A dog's nose is like our eyes. So letting them smell, um, you know, different things outside of their immediate household is important um, and continuing to socialize them with both people and dogs and challenging their mind with things like doggy puzzles can be a really great way to keep a senior dog healthy. Um, so just to summarize the take home messages here, remember that there are a lot of physiologic changes that are taking place with aging. Choose oral supplements wisely based on the level of evidence. Um, these are the ones that I choose most commonly. So green lip muscle extract, eggshell membrane, astaxanthin, CBD, and fortitropin are all backed by randomized controlled clinical trials in dogs. Um, and don't forget to use an integrative approach, um, incorporating exercise, weight management and excellent nutrition, as well as mental and social well-being. And with that, I would like to open it up for any questions that you have. Um, so, so, Dr. Alvarez, we have uh, one question uh, that has come in. Uh, it is, what about using turmeric with uh, black pepper? That's a great question. That's commonly done in people. So turmeric alone, like if you buy that off the shelf, um, it's not gonna do much, it's just not bioavailable. You really want that extract curcumin because that's gonna be in a higher concentration. Um, while that has been demonstrated to help with bioavailability in people, that has never been shown to be true in animals. So I, I don't recommend adding black pepper to your uh, diet of dogs. Okay, we, we have a bunch of questions that have just come in, so. Okay. Uh, omega-3, do, do you like omega-3 fatty acids for cats? Yes, absolutely fantastic, particularly for your elderly cats, because they're almost always going to be suffering both from osteoarthritis and renal disease, and omega-3 fatty acids benefit both. Um, okay. Again, I do prefer to supplement it in the diet. Um, so Hills, for example, right now is making a mobility renal diet where they combine um, the two. And so you get those very high levels of omega-3 fatty acids. But yes, I absolutely love omega-3 fatty acids for uh, older kitties. Okay, so uh, I think you may have already answered this question, uh, but a question came in that do you have an omega-3 omega fatty acid product that you recommend that is higher in quality? You had mentioned Hills. Um, well, that's, are, are a, that's a diet. So again, if you look at the literature and the level of evidence, the majority of the studies, except for one, there was one study published by Mayer, uh, which was the VRS product that was on an oral supplement, but every single other published study uh, demonstrating the efficacy of omega-3 fatty acids in dogs um, and actually in cats was supplemented in the diet. Um, so if you're gonna follow that level of evidence, you should use those joint protective diets that are fortified with omega-3 because you can get, so the doses in those diets are usually upwards of 300 mg per kg. So much higher than what you could ever do as an oral supplement. But companies that I trust um, for oral supplementation, um, Nordic Naturals is one that I have used a the only company that has a paper that was published um, supporting efficacy of their product. Okay, another question that has come in is, do you, do you ever recommend mushroom supplements like turkey tail? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, Coriolis in particular, uh, which is turkey tail, um, had a randomized controlled clinical trial out of Pennsylvania showing efficacy for hemangiosarcoma. And I do use uh, uh, Coriolis, uh, particularly for dogs with hemangiosarcoma, be because of that trial that was done. But I don't use it routinely in senior dogs unless they're immune compromised. I see. Okay. A question that has come in from, uh, from the audience. Uh, are there any comments that you have about epi epitalis uh, to improve cartilage? I haven't used that product. No. Okay. Um, I, I believe, so, so this question, I'm trying to understand the context. Uh, at, at 100 at 100 migs per kg for cats, I'm wondering if that question was in the context of, of. Uh... Yeah, so that was the dosing for omega-3 fatty acids. So you're correct. Yes, I'm still trying to get to that 100 migs per kg total EPA plus DHA for cats. That's correct. Yeah, you will right, also right, see okay. diarrhea in them the same as you will in dogs. But um, so again, if you're able to get most renal diets now actually are fortified in omega-3 fatty acids because their studies demonstrated improved GFR for cats being um, fortified with omega-3s for renal disease. Um, so it's going to benefit the joints as well. Um, so again, if you can use the diet it, if not, uh, aim for 100 mg per kg for both dogs and cats for omega-3. Okay, now uh, so, some uh, further questions that have come in. Uh, is there any evidence for creatine supplementation in cats for muscle building? There is not. Um, and actually in people, uh, it doesn't seem to work either. So I don't recommend it. There was actually a nice paper published by Justin Schmalberg um, and for endurance athletes, so for sports medicine, nutrition, uh, creatine is something that was tested in dogs and doesn't seem to help. It might be helpful in a disease state. And actually for fortitropin, I can tell you that I have seen the greatest efficacy uh, using fortitropin in dogs that have a condition. So either they're elderly and they're suffering from sarcopenia or they have cancer cachexia or they have renal cachexia or cardiac cachexia or they have degenerative myelopathy. Um, and they seem to respond the best to fortitropin. Um, we don't tend to use uh, creatine, but that would be, again, if you're wanting to use it, I would use it in patients that are losing muscle mass as opposed to trying to build muscle, if that makes sense. I see that. That makes sense. A uh, question that has come in, uh, where can we find eggshell membrane? Um, so eggshell membrane is something that um, was added as a sort of new wave of joint supplements um, in a supplement made by Verbeck called Movoflex. It actually combines Boswellia and Astaxanthin as well. So I really like that supplement. And then the new Dosequin Advanced, I think because they caught on to how popular eggshell membrane was, they've now added that into their Dosequin Advanced. Um, the only thing with a Dosequin Advanced is it does have that glucosamine and chondroitin in it. And I, I'm not a big fan of that based on the level of evidence. Um, so those are combination products that have um, uh, eggshell membrane in them. But then you can also purchase it as a separate supplement. And then you just need to look into the company uh, and make sure that you trust the labeling. Um, th thanks. What, one uh, other question is, what about uh, legalities around recommending CBD? Yeah, so it's now not scheduled. So um, check with your state because some individual states still have some regulations, but it, it is no longer a DEA. Um, so it's basically an over the counter now. So that's that really changes the game. Okay, great. And um, one other question. What about myelin uh, sheath uh, bovine spinal cord from New Zealand? Oh, uh, gosh. I hadn't heard of that one. There's so many supplements out there. I have to admit, I, I have not known that one. I thought you were going to talk about because, you know, one of the reasons I really like using antioxidants in older patients is because of the oxidative damage that happens along the myelin sheath and the spinal cord. So I really love antioxidants for dogs that are suffering from spinal diseases like intervertebral disc disease and also in my older patients because you're getting that decreased nerve conduction velocity and that's because of a loss of myelin so i have not used that product but again 
put to place the advice that I gave you today, which is that check, have they tested bioavailability? Have they demonstrated that that product is bioavailable in the species? And they do they have a clinical trial demonstrating efficacy? So um, I, I don't like my patients being guinea pigs. Uh, I like to use products that have shown both safety, efficacy, and bioavailability when possible. Okay, uh, we, we don't have any questions right now. Uh, are, are there any other questions from the audience? If you do have questions, uh, feel free to, to type in your questions and, and, and I'll be happy to read them to, to Dr. Alvarez. I, I was wondering, Dr. Alvarez, about, uh, about turmeric and about curcumin. I, I have, uh, being from in a family of Indian descent, I have uh, consumed a lot of turmeric over the last uh, 40 plus years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I mean, it, it seems like the issue with, uh, with, with turmeric is always that it, it's just so bitter, right? I mean, there's so many papers that have been published about, you know, all, all of the beneficial effects of, of curcumin, but it's so bitter. I mean, do you, do you typically give dogs uh, curcumin in the, or, or turmeric in the capsule form? or how, Yes, how you... correct. Yeah, that's a really great tip from somebody who has actually had it in their food. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I have some clients that will just sprinkle turmeric on their dog's food. And I'm like, you know, it's not going to do any harm. I don't think it's going to be clinically efficacious, but that's correct. You know, if you're going to administer curcumin, you want it definitely encapsulated because it is quite bitter. Uh, and you need the company to have tested the bioavailability because it is just so extremely low. I see. One other question that just came in, uh, any chance to get some copies of your slides about the changes in senior dogs? Yeah, I'm happy to send you proceedings. All right, great. Yeah. And um, I think that is about it. Maybe we can hang around for another 30 seconds or so. This was a patient, I didn't tell you my last slide here. Um, this was Charlotte, a dog that I saw when she was 16 and we thought she was gonna be euthanized because her mobility was so decreased. And um, we actually started her on Fortitropin and the dog went on, this was actually her 18th birthday. She celebrated not just her 17th birthday, but her 18th birthday. So um, I, I am a fan of using Fortitropin in, in senior dogs. Oh, that that's... That's wonderful. Yeah. So if, uh, if you have any other questions that, that you, uh, you can think of, uh, what you can do is you can email them to me. I can pass them on to Dr. Alvarez. Uh, my email address is npadlia, uh, N-P-A-D-L-I-Y-A, at myoscorp, M-Y-O-S-C-O-R-P dot com. Uh, I, I will I'll pass on your questions to Dr. Alvarez, make sure that uh, she, she's able to get back to you. And um, it looks like- um, Maybe Nirav, I was gonna suggest if you type your email into the chat there and then everybody I, can see it. I see, okay. Um, and uh, the other thing is that this webinar has been recorded. so. Uh, afterwards, you know, the, we, we will uh, upload a recording of this webinar onto our YouTube channel, which is myosped.com. So, uh, you know, if, if there is anything that Dr. Alvarez had talked about that you had missed, you can always go back uh, earlier and, and take a look at that. And, uh, and uh, l likewise, um, and, and you, can, you can feel free to email me. Uh, it looks like there are one question that came in was, do we, um, how long would it take to see the results of fortitropin? Oh, that's a really excellent question. I usually see effects at around seven to 10 days of starting it. Right, and in, in the study that Dr. Alvarez had talked about uh, that, that was done at Kansas State, so that's a study that I'm intimately familiar with because we had sponsored that study and we had worked with the investigator. You know, that, that was a study <coughs> <clears throat> that was a study that was done in recovery uh, after TPLO surgery. And so eight weeks after TPLO surgery, we did see uh, some, some very significant uh, impact that fortitropin had on these recovering dogs uh, that underwent TPLO surgery. But that's from the paper that, that Dr. Alvarez had uh, discussed. Um, another question, Dr. Alvarez, do you recall how quickly results were seen 
with the patient you just mentioned? I, I think the patient she is referring to is the... Oh, the elderly patient, Charlotte, right. that I had here. Right. Um, she took a little bit longer, about a month. Okay. Uh, it depends on, you know, she had a lot of other comorbidities. So she actually had cancer, um, not cancer, I'm sorry, cardiac cachexia. She had advanced uh, cardiac disease and pulmonary hypertension. And she actually even had a pacemaker. Um, so when you have other comorbidities and other reasons why they're losing muscle, um, it potentially might take a little bit longer. But um, I would say that for most of my senior patients, seven to 10 days, but I would give it for a minimum of 30 days before stopping it. Uh, somebody is asking, did you see uh, biopreparation F, F2 type products? Are, are, are they good? Mm, not sure that I'm familiar with that one either. Uh, we have a question. I, I guess th this is probably more suited to me. When will fortitropin be available in, in Canada? Uh, we're, we're not sure at this point. We, we're working with, uh, with, with Health Canada on that. And uh, we'll, 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 I'll be sure to get back to you on that when uh, there is some uh, development on that front. Uh, what is microalgae, Dr. Alvarez? Uh, microalgae, uh, well, there's a lot of different algae products. I mean, the one that I talked about was red marine algae with astaxanthin. I don't know which one you have in mind. There are also some green algae that are used therapeutically. I see, it, it, it was a question. Do, do you know what is the primary indication? For, for those, you know, the one, the. So for, for the astaxanthin, the red marine algae is I, as, I, an I anti, as an antioxidant. As an antioxidant, all right. Correct. That's right, yeah. okay, I missed that. Um, yeah. Uh, someone has asked, it mentions that it helps with cognitive uh, health also on the package. Have you seen it help with CDS? I'm not sure. Uh, you mean which for fortitropin or which supplement we're, yeah, we're talking about I, astaxanthin? I wonder, I, I wonder if she is asking about astaxanthin. Um, it mentions that it also helps with cognitive health. So I'll, I'll answer for both fortitropin um, and for astaxanthin. So for astaxanthin, I would say yes, because we actually have that clinical trial that was conducted that demonstrated improved mitochondrial function. And that effect was greater in geriatric dogs than in younger dogs. As far as fortitropin, uh, oh. I'm, Perhaps, perhaps one benefit that has not been, has certainly not been clinically tested in dogs for improvement of canine cognitive dysfunction, but where it could potentially have a benefit is that um, remember that, you know, with for, with myostatin levels increasing, then, you know, if you have a decrease in muscle mass, so things like urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence that come as part of the the, the group of symptoms that we see with canine cognitive dysfunction. If you're gaining muscle mass and strength, that could benefit um, the incontinence issue. Um, the other thing is that protein, as you saw when I spoke about geriatric nutrition, dogs actually need more protein as they get older and uh, fortitropin is rich in protein. Not too high for a renal failure patient, but it is a protein supplement. Um, and I think that would be beneficial for a dog with canine cognitive dysfunction. But as far as directly affecting brain function, I, I can't, I, I don't know of any mechanism to explain that. So what, what I wanted to add to that, uh, Dr. Alvarez, is that, you know, fortitropin, as you know, is made from pure 100% fertilized chicken egg yolk. And yeah. egg yolk, as you know, is a rich source of choline, which is the precursor to true. acetylcholine. That's true. So, you know, we have not done any, any studies on fortitropin per se, uh, you know, with, with, with respect to any cognitive type indication, but you know, it, it's well known that you need choline uh, in, in order to produce the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Correct. And in fact, I've actually used choline as a supplement for canine cognitive dysfunction. So that's really great that you mentioned that because here's a natural source of it. So, so yeah, that's a great point. So yeah, could, could, be, it could be a benefit. Okay, I can great. certainly tell you that one of the biggest reports I get from clients that take fortitropin is that their dog um, is 
more energetic um, and also just more interactive. So m maybe it is increasing brain function. The other thing is that because it is from egg yolk, egg yolk product, it's very rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and so it has a very nice um, support for anti-inflammatory effects in the body, you know, in addition to myostatin, you know, it's natural products often have multiple things at play. And so I, I wonder if, you know, the, the choline, but also the omega-3 fatty acids that are in there, I think those are likely also playing a beneficial role. Right. And, uh, you know, it's interesting you brought that up, that we do have a, a study, a clinical study that's currently underway at Kansas State University with, with Professor Harkin that is looking at the impact of fortitropin on quality of life and, and mm -hmm. mobility in geriatric dogs. So, you know, yeah. since, since you'd raised that point. Yeah. Um, right. Let's see if uh, we have any more questions. We'll we'll, we'll wait another thirty seconds uh, more or so to see if uh, any other questions do come in. And uh, doesn't doesn't seem like it yet. It does say. Certainly has been a nice warm day here in uh, Grafton, Massachusetts. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for attending the webinar. Uh, for, and, uh, thanks once again uh, to you, Dr. Alvarez. It was really a, a fantastic webinar. We, we all learned a lot and really enjoyed, uh, in, enjoyed your talk over the past one hour. And we, this was you. a great, great discussion uh, as, as well. So take care, everyone. Uh, have a great day uh, and, uh, and stay safe. And Thank I guess you. That's it for today. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.